Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 534 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 20th of February 2021 as I record this in a really rainy day here in lockdown three in England. (laughs) So in today's show I'm talking to Sarah Rosette about how to structure and write a series. Definitely one of the important aspects of making a living with your writing regardless of genre and a tentpole series whether it's fiction or non-fiction can keep paying the bills over time and we talk about tips whether you are a plotter or a pantser and uh, I talk about some of my issues with series uh, some of the pros and cons and difficulties and uh, so it is it is primarily for fiction uh, series but again writing a series is a good thing regardless of genre so that is coming up in the interview In publishing news this week, I guess this is publishing book marketing media, uh, Facebook, (laughs) after months of threats and failed attempts to lobby the government over proposed new media laws, Facebook banned the sharing of news in Australia, as reported by The Guardian and tons of other places. Uh, So basically, Australia woke up and all the news producers had been blocked. But um, so the main national broadcaster ABC was down, the Guardian Australia was down, and uh, a whole load of other things were down. So things like the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, Meteorology, (laughs) can't say that, which uses its Facebook page to deliver climate updates and severe weather warnings was blocked. So too was the Western Australian Department of Fire and Emergency Services, all the governments uh, in various territories, hospitals, family violence centres, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders media pages, and just a whole load of things that were not, that should not have been blocked, were blocked. And this is this is a, quite a big deal, I think. I mean, essentially, this is really impacting Facebook's reputation. The Guardian notes, the sudden national blackout of legitimate information sources appears to some to expose the hollowness of Facebook's prior claims that it was unable to suppress hate speech or pages spreading dangerous misinformation and failure to respond to reports of abuse. With sufficient motivation, like the prospect of having to pay for news content, the social media giant was able to act swiftly. So this is this is definitely... <laughs> Uh, damaging to Facebook's reputation. They restored a lot of those pages quite quickly. But, um, you know, (laughs) having lived in Australia for five years, Australians definitely have a culture of, well, you know, we'll do without them kind of thing. And it's galvanising the response against big tech here in Europe as well. And in fact, um, The Guardian in a different article says the platform's own irresponsible and chaotic implementation of its Australian news ban appears to have rallied the country. Citizens and politicians from across the aisles and governments from around the world, including over here in Europe, uh, to support the Australian government's resolve. So I think this is very interesting and certainly they can't claim to not be able to shut things down quick enough. (laughs) That's for sure. Uh, I also, um, whatever you think about what happened also with uh, ex-President Trump, whatever side of the house you're on, obviously there was one point where he was taken off Facebook and Twitter and all of the media services. And now this happened in Australia as well. So again, it's nothing different to what I've always said. Don't rely on any of these big companies. They can take away your access at any point. And clearly none of us are as important as a US president or a government in Australia or a big news corporation. So I think, again, more wake up calls for us to make sure you are not depending on these platforms for all of your income just in case things go bad. 
And I talked about the Apple privacy setting change, which is going through at the moment, which will impact Facebook ads. And Thomas Umstadt at Author Media has a great podcast episode with show notes, if you prefer to read about the changes coming to Facebook and how it will impact authors. He goes through the rise and fall of Facebook pages, groups and live, and particularly emphasises the demise of groups and the importance of getting email addresses from your group members so you can potentially transition to other platforms. He notes, while iPhone users make up a minority of users, they have an outsized impact for advertisers because they are wealthier and more educated on average. This is especially important for authors because it's believed that iPhone users buy more books than Android users, which is interesting. He says, if you advertise your books on Facebook, you may have a harder time finding new readers. And since the privacy settings will mean less personalisation, basically, your ads may become less effective and more expensive. If the costs of reader acquisition increase, it may become impossible to advertise on Facebook profitably. Facebook is expecting a 60% decrease in revenue for advertisers. Uh, Although, essentially, he also says this change may hurt larger advertisers and Facebook ads may end up getting cheaper for indie authors. Who knows as ever? So if you do advertise on Facebook, as I do, track the performance of your ads carefully. And again, this is is exactly the same. Just don't rely on it. (laughs) build your platform on something you control and pay for. I mean, even free websites have exactly the same thing. If something is free, then you are the product. If you're so podcasting is another example, you know, I pay for hosting for my podcast and have done for over a decade. And if you use any free platform, they you're essentially signing up with terms and conditions that they can do basically whatever they like and use your data for advertising and all that. And that's fine. If you you accept no and accept that it's a bit like signing a uh, publishing contract go ahead as long as you know what you're signing and what you're agreeing to and how long that will last and all of those things it's all about education and decisions but um, certainly your author platform for the long term build on something you own and control which is an author website, an email list. And uh, again, if you want a tutorial, mine is at thecreativepen.com forward slash author website. And there is uh, tutorials there for uh, website, email list and setup, etc. I also did a, in useful stuff, I made a video tutorial this week on how to sell ebooks and audiobooks direct with Payhip and BookFunnel, which was epic. Uh, it, it took many hours to create <laughs> the tutorial, even though the finished product is only about half an hour. And of course, you don't need to go through all of it. You can skip to the bit you're interested in. But um, yeah, so how to sell ebooks and audiobooks direct with Payhip and BookFunnel. I talk about the benefits of selling direct and my various tips before getting into the screenshots of how to set it all up. Um, So it might be worth having a look if you're considering selling direct. That's at thecreativepen.com forward slash sell direct tutorial. And it is pretty funny in the video because (laughs) it did take me so long to record it. At the beginning, I'm all perky with makeup and I'm like, hello and all of this stuff. And I I definitely have better makeup at the beginning. And by the end, I look pretty haggard. (laughs) But it was worth the effort. So I hope it's useful to you. Also, in my personal update, I did the first edit of my glass blowing short story this week. I really think like those of you who write short stories regularly, maybe it's because I don't do it regularly, but it's so it's a lot of extra work, it seems, for what is essentially this story is about 3000 at the moment, 3000 words. And uh, the it seems a lot more intense than writing a novel. <laughs> which is funny. But I also remembered that I'd written a short story ages ago. In fact, it turned out to be 2015, which I which never saw the light of day. I actually entered that into a competition and I never did anything with it. So I've printed that out. I'm going to radically re-edit that. It definitely, my writing has got a lot better in five years. <laughs> that's for sure. And I'm going to edit that. And uh, that's actually based on Christmas markets. So it, I'll have a look at what to do with that one. But uh, it's dark. It's the dark side of Christmas markets, which we didn't even have last year. So, and Bath normally has a Christmas market, but of course we didn't. No, nowhere did. Uh, but um, yeah, so I'm kind of enjoying having a look at these short pieces. And then I'm going to rest both of them and I will get into the research for Day of the Martyr, which is my next arcane thriller based on the relics of Thomas Beckett. 
And that will weave in some of my aspects of the Canterbury walk. And there is actually an exhibition at the British Museum, which runs from the 22nd of April. Uh, Now, you can't even buy tickets for it because we're still in lockdown and we don't know when we're coming out. But hopefully, oh, really, seriously, fingers crossed, we better be out of here by the end of April. (sighs) That will definitely have things which will help the book. and But it's funny because I'm like, well, I don't want to get too much into it because I want to go to that exhibition. So maybe I should work on some other things before then. And I'm actually noodling. Noodling's a good word. I'm noodling over three fiction projects, uh, books, two standalone and another series, as well as a couple of non-fiction projects. And it's always difficult to decide what your next project should be, especially when you're really hoping that you can get out of lockdown and go and do some travel or at least another big walk or something. So I'm definitely in one of these in-between phases right now where I can't really decide. And that's not like me at all. As I talked about last week, I have a bias for action, but I'm, I'm trying to actually think (laughs) more strategically and I wonder if it's this decade uh, anniversary that's also made me feel this way I've achieved a lot of my goals and there are some goals I haven't achieved and I'm trying to decide okay well if I think more strategically about my fiction career what should I work on next so I'll let you know if I come up with anything I am in the meantime recording the audiobook of how to make a living with your writing third edition and uh, I'm basically doing I have to do, do a couple of hours every morning before well even even just an hour really before Jonathan starts work because he's obviously working from home and I have to finish narrating by about 8:45 a.m. so that he he gets on the phone and all of that so but it's so interesting because some mornings it takes a while for my voice to warm up obviously you have to do warm-up stuff and then uh, by the time I actually get to the narration I can really only do an hour in this box I mean (laughs) if you've seen pictures of my home studio it's essentially a a box with blankets around it and everything and uh, I can really only do about an hour and then I'm too tired so I'm sort of it's taking longer than Uh, I hoped, but I think we're all tired, right? Just tired of life. (laughs) But, you know, we'll get through it. So How to Make a Living with Your Writing 3rd Edition out 15th of March 2021. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. Kristen sent a lovely smiling picture from the snow in Wisconsin. Definitely when, (laughs) when I talked about the snow here I was sent lots of pictures of snow in other places in the world saying you don't have snow you have some kind of light dusting of white stuff (laughs) we haven't had any since either Uh, Paul says thanks so much for your interview with Alison Jones I've already published one non-fiction book and have an idea for a larger series your questions and Alison's responses were very helpful especially regarding book length and audience specificity I'm really struggling with speaking today probably because I've been recording so much (laughs) And uh, Jamie L. Biggs says, I listened to one of your podcasts on dictation. OMG, it was a game changer. Thank you for explaining the benefits. And yes, dictation. As I said, I dictated that first draft of the short story that's um, on glass blowing, which I just went out for a couple of hours and and wrote that So uh, and dictated that. So really love dictation when I know what I'm going to write. Lots of articles and podcasts at thecreativepen.com forward slash dictation, if that's something you're interested in. So today's show is sponsored by draft to digital and I'll play a word from Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. Now I use draft to digital for distribution to Nook, various library services and more. And remember, even if you don't use draft to digital, you can still use books to read.com books number two read.com to create a single link that will redirect to various wide stores for ebooks and audiobooks. So that's super useful. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons. Yes, my patrons support my brain. (laughs) Thanks to new and returning patrons in the last few weeks, Helen Cox and Chelsea Davis. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. And I put out the Q&A this week. And if you join as a new patron, you get access to the entire backlist. So lots more audio of me answering specific questions from lots of authors on every aspect of writing, publishing, book marketing, making a living with your writing, mindset, all of that. I do about 40 minutes every month of extra Q&A. So you can support the show at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. And uh, here's a word from Kevin at Draft the Digital and then we'll get into the interview. 
Hey, this is Kevin Tomlinson with Draft to Digital. So, if you've ever co authored a book or tried to build a box set, you know the biggest pain is how to split up the royalties. That's why we at Draft to Digital have built D2D payment splitting. We've made it easy for you to share payments with other collaborators on your projects in whatever percentages you prefer. Right from the setup of your book, you can invite participants, agree on who gets paid what, and go. DDD takes care of all those pesky details like tax interviews and making sure everyone gets paid on time. And of course, you continue to own the rights to your work. So, get started on your collaborative project now at drafttodigital.com. We've made it easy for you. See you there. Sarah Rosette is the USA Today bestselling author of Cozy Mysteries, Travel and Historical Mysteries, as well as books and courses for writers, including how to write a series and how to outline a cozy mystery. She's also a podcaster at Wish I'd Known Then with co-host Jamie Albright. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, Joanna. It's great to be here. Oh, it's so exciting to have you on the show. So let's get started. Tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing. Okay. I've always loved reading. I've always loved books. I've always loved mysteries. And so I read so many books when I was a kid and my dream was to write a fiction novel. So what did I do? I went to school and got a degree in language and literature and spent my time writing essays instead of fiction. You just, that was the way you did it then. It was like, and you'll just do your writing on the side. So I got a job and I worked, I had jobs where I worked writing travel copy. I worked at a company that did tours. And so I wrote copy and I did other writing related jobs, but I was not writing fiction. And that was always in the back of my mind, but I couldn't quite figure out like what type of book. And then I found cozies and I was like, oh, I think I could write one of these. So I was just consuming all these cozies and figuring out how the plot worked in those. And then I got married and we had little kids and my husband said, I think it's about time one of us went back to school and got a master's degree. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing that. If I'm going to take time to do something else besides parent and keep up with the kids, I want to write a book. And he said, okay, go for it. Because he knew that I wanted to do that. And so I started, I had two kids under four and I just carved out little bits of time, like when they were napping or in preschool and started working on a book. And I went to writers conferences and it was a quite a long process. It took about five years to write the book, edit it. At at that point, that was like 2004, 2005. And I found an agent, she sold it. And that became uh, the first series I wrote. And there were 10 books in that series. And then I was several books into that about 2010, I heard about indie publishing. And I was like, hmm, these people are, I was hearing about people that were paying their mortgage with the money they were making on ebooks and self-publishing. And I was like, I definitely need to look into this because <laughs> that's not what, if you're a midlist author, you're not paying your mortgage with your royalties. So I checked into that and I just, I wanted to do it. And I tested it out with some short stories and I had no intellectual property that I controlled. So I wrote a new series and became an indie, became a hybrid publisher for a while. And now I'm all in indie. Wow, that is quite a journey. And it's very interesting. I want to pick up on you said you carved out bits of time while raising your kids. And I know this is a question that a lot of people have. And you said 10 books there you did with that mm-hmm. first publisher. So how did you, how did you find those bits of time then? And, and how are you doing it now? So managing your time as an author? When my kids were little, I just I knew that I had certain bits of time during the day that I could get maybe 10 or 15 minutes. One of my kids, when she was a little bit older, I'd take her, drop her off at preschool, go back home, put my younger son down for a nap. And then I knew I had 20 minutes. When you have that, you don't have time to dilly dally. And it's actually great because it makes you focus so much. And so I would just dive in and I would just get the words down. And I would think before about what I wanted to write. And that helped me because I'm a thinker and it t- I have to process. And so if I just knew I'm just going to try and get down one page or half a scene, that's what I would do. And then at that point, some I had a lot of things where I was taking kids places, like to the dentist and to the you know, sports things or to wait in the carpool line to pick them up. And I would print out my manuscript and take it with me to edit it. So I was always carrying around this big binder that was about two inches thick with (laughs) tons of pages and scribbling. So I don't do that now, but as my kids have gotten older, it's gotten easier because there's more time. 
but then I think it just changes as your kids get older. You're, you're not taking care of them every day, but there are certain things where, oh, now we need to go help them move from one apartment to another or something like that. So it's just, I just learned to write in the time that I could make. And it was a slow process and I didn't have the pressures that people have now with starting out and trying to write several books or trying to produce several books a year. I was writing one book a year and, and that was, it worked out well for me. And, but I'm glad I had, I had to do it because it taught me how to make the most of little bits of time. I, I don't think anyone starts out writing several books a year. <laughs> I, mean, I think that first book can take a long time. What did you say? It took five years to do your first book. Yes. Yes, it did. And that was like learning how to write a book and learning and researching the publishing industry and how all that worked and what my options were. So I was doing both at the same time. And yeah, it's, it, I, I certainly couldn't whip out a book in six months for my first book. <laughs> exactly. Now, I think you've got four series. Is that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, four series. A couple of them have ended. So why is writing a series a good idea as opposed to a standalone? And what are the pros and cons of that? I think the first reason would be that readers love a series. And if you want to keep your readers happy. And so I think with a series, if you can get your readers hooked in on book one, then it's book two and three and on down the road is an easier sell perhaps than a standalone because your readers are familiar with the characters in the world. And so that's one reason to do it is because readers are looking for those and they want that. If they enjoy the experience, they want to return to that same world again. And then there's some financial stability with writing a series. You're, if you know that book one made a certain amount of money, then maybe book two and three may not be that exact amount, but you can predict a little bit, gives you some uh, predictability in your financial planning. And not always, but sometimes writing a, f- a familiar series and characters can be a little bit easier and it can go faster because you already know the world. So you're not world building with each book, but each book is its own its own process. And sometimes you may think, oh, this I've thought, oh, this will go fast. It's book five. And sometimes it just doesn't and it takes longer, but you do have the basics, that structure that you can go back to that you don't have to rebuild every time. And another thing is you can go really deep with themes if you want across books, because you can extend it out across a series instead of just having one book. And then there's marketing reasons for promotion and that make a series a good thing to have. You can save time, you can focus on book one in your marketing, and then you're not trying to run ads to all the books in your catalog. You can focus on one and hopefully as readers come into that book one, if they like it, they'll continue on and you don't have to put as much time into marketing the Mm. other books in the series. We'll we'll come back on marketing a series, but on, um, on writing. So you've got several and you said that some are finished, which Mm -hmm. I think some people don't might not get what that means compared (laughs) to, uh, especially mystery. If you think Mm -hmm. Poirot, for example, Mm -hmm. mystery series can go on forever because the detective is just always solving something or the, Mm -hmm. uh, whoever is solving the crime can solve them over and over again. So what are the different kinds of series that people do and do anything? Does anything work particularly well? in different genres. Okay. This is something that I didn't understand when I first became a writer. And when I searched for information on writing a series, I couldn't really find that much. And it seemed like all the writing information was focused on the hero's journey and how to write a good book. And I was like, but how do you, you know, make it where you have a series of good books? And so what I've discovered is that there's different types of series and that there's two main types, the multi-protagonist, which is usually you have a different main character in each book and they're linked in some way through a family or a location or even a job setting like the Bridgerton series and books that are out now, like the Bridgerton Netflix series, that would be like a multi-protagonist because it's the same family, but each story is a different character. Each character has their own book. And then, so you've got the multi-protagonist and then you've also got the single protagonist uh, series, which it just follows one character And there's tons of different variations that can be used in any type of genre. But then in underneath the single protagonist, you can have a robust character arc where you're, it's more of the hero's journey. There's a big change from beginning to end, like Harry Potter, but those types of series, they do have an end point. And they, if you reach the end of the hero's journey, you've reached the end of the series usually. And then you have the, the flat art character 
And that main character essentially, essentially stays the same. It would be like a Perot, Jason Bourne, a Jack Reacher type character where they come in and they stay the same, but the story world changes around them or they influence the characters in the story world and those characters change. And that type is more episodic and it can be endless, like you were saying. It's as long as you can keep coming up with problems that need to be solved, mysteries that need to be solved, murders that need to be solved, things like that, you can keep going. And that last type has been most successful for me. And it really fits with the mystery genre expectations. And it's what I like to read. So it's a nice uh, blend of what I like and what the readers expect. That's a really good load of explanation there because <laughs> I I'm, I started writing my Arcane series. That was the, the first no- novel, Stone of Fire. And what I did was I found an author I really like, so James Rollins, who writes the Sigma series. And I was like, what does he do? And I'll do something like that. And I also love, you know, James Bond movies. And so mm-hmm. I'm definitely the sort of the episodic or I guess you called it a flat arc yeah. Um, where there is l- a small amount of character de- mm-hmm. development, but you can't you can't kill off your main characters. <laughs> you pretty much unless you're going to really end something. You, doing that really sc- scuppers the whole thing. Unless you're going to <laughs> <laughs> you know, try and bring them back, um, and yeah. you have something paranormal. But it's interesting because, right. of course, you mentioned the mystery series is very much similar, and that people mm-hmm. often want to see the same detective over and over. So, what are some examples? Of romance obviously generally has a finish happy ending for Mm -hmm. one character as he said with Bridgerton and then you have to pick different characters for the next Mm -hmm. one because you've done that unless you're going to start with a divorce or something you mentioned there about themes extending across the series do you have an example of that because I think that sounds really interesting okay so one that comes to mind is the Enola Holmes the books and the series the Netflix series the they both are very similar in that they start out with her mother leaves. And so she's trying to figure out what happened to her mother. And in the Netflix series, they give you some resolution at the end of the first series, but in the books, you don't know. And she has a complete uh, story that she gets involved in this mystery and solves the mystery. But then at the end of that, there are more clues, more things related to her mother that she's still searching for. So search, for a quest type thing could go across several books. A romance could go across several books. As long as it's not a romance series, that would defeat the purpose of that. But there's just different um, themes that you can draw out over the course of a series that will pull readers from one book to the other. And how does this work if you're a, a detailed plotter or if you're more of a discovery writer? Because I found, I thought I was writing a third series with my Matt Walker fantasy books. And then when I was writing book three, I realized that it was a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, that means this has ended. Now I could write more in the world, but that particular, that is a trilogy. It's done. The, mm-hmm. protag- the main protagonist story is done. No, no spoilers, obviously. But so how do you know what you're writing? Do you plot more than one book in a series or uh, with, because your books are episodic, you don't really have to? This is something I've learned over time. So when I first started out and I had that first book that was sold, I knew it would be a series because it was a cozy and cozies are almost always a series. But I And I had some ideas for different mysteries that could be in the next books, but I didn't have a big overarching plan. And now I think more in terms of general plan, I have a a plan for like, I'll think, okay, this series is going like the historical mysteries that I'm writing right now. It's about a woman who is finding her way in the world. She's becoming independent and she realizes she's good at this detective thing. And so the first three books are all about her kind of learning that, finding her feet. And then I thought, okay, if that does well, that's a nice enclosed thing. And if it doesn't do well, I can end it there. But if it does, I can go on. And so like the next three books, I was, I planned, okay, she can gather her team. She can have people come to her, like friends will refer people to her and that will be, she's getting established. And then in the next three books, strangers will come to her and she will be an established detective at that point, a discreet uh, detective for the upper class in London, because maybe they don't want to hire a private detective. And that just gave me a general framework that I could work within but it wasn't too restrictive that I couldn't change it on the, I couldn't make adjustments. And then if it didn't, if the series hadn't done well, I could have ended it at book three and I didn't 
leave readers with all these open loops that they had no answers to. That's really good because I, I don't plot and or outline, although I keep trying. <laughs> I keep <laughs> trying. People who've listened to this show for years will have heard me over and over again try try this. But then, you know, obviously Lindsay Baroka, who does fantasy and came on to talk about her series, and she really does seem to have in mind this is a six book series or an mm-hmm. eight book series, and then writes the whole thing and then releases it, which mm-hmm. to me seems like uh, something I would love to be able to do, but that's just not me. And it sounds like you're you basically don't think eight books. No. And like the idea of ending a series was very, I was a little afraid of that because in like you're saying, a mystery and thriller series can go on for 20 Mm -hmm. books and readers expect that. I think different genres have different expectations. So I think sci-fi and fantasy, there's more of an expectation of a three book series or a six book series and it's done. Whereas mystery readers, they seem to assume that the series can go on and will go on. But as writers, sometimes like I know that some of my books in my series, I've come to the end of my ideas and my plot possibilities. And so for me, that means it's time to end it. But yeah, I think it does depend on kind of what genre you're in and how you work as a writer. And I'm not super detailed in my planning, but I do like to have a point that I'm going to that makes me feel better. Yeah, and I know what you mean because some of the series I love, like to mention James Rollins again, his Sigma mm-hmm. series I love, but Preston and Child with the Pendergast series is a kind mm-hmm. of mystery. And mm-hmm. what I find, as you say, they're both over 20 books by now. I think obviously yeah. Jack Reach is over 20 books. And it's interesting because I feel like some books in a series that long hit all the genre tropes that I want and I'm like yes this is awesome and then (laughs) some of the books feel like they haven't quite hit the mark so how do you and it may have been that it may have just been personal taste but it may have also been that the authors were a bit sick of the characters but they had (laughs) to write a book I feel that happens sometimes and that feels I feel that I put out uh, Tree of Life just before Christmas and that was two years after the previous Mm -hmm. Arcane book because I just wasn't ready to write uh, those characters again so mm-hmm. how do you keep your series characters fresh for you in the writing mm-hmm. but also fresh in terms of the books so they're not repetitive when I first started out and I knew I'd figured out I was writing a flat art character and she wasn't going to have this big huge character change but I thought in each book I'll give her just like a little challenge something that she needs to learn or overcome or just something small And so that helped with that type of series. But now I like the idea of having bigger themes that run throughout the series. So like I have a romance theme that's running through my current series and readers love that, especially in mystery. That's, I get more email about the romance than about the mystery. So obviously they're (laughs) in for that. (laughs) But I also like the entrepreneurial theme. Like I have characters that they're, I had another series where, I thought, like you, that this book is done. It's a three, three book series, it's done. And I got to the end of that and the readers were interested and they said, can you do, we want more. And at that point, I I was like, "I yes, if you're asking for it, yes. And so I figured out a way to write a fourth book. The characters were together, the problems were solved. It was like them launching their new life together. And there was a mystery, they solved it. And I got to the end of that book and I thought, oh, this could be a new career for my main character. She could, Mm. and it turned into a series about art theft and art and recovery of priceless things. She worked as a consultant for that. So like that launched her in like a whole new business economic type field. Could she solve her first case? Could she work on her own? So that gave her like a new, launched a new series arc for her. The different types of arcs, that's how I like to do it. I like to have something that, is interesting that people are interested in. And sometimes that can be even in the secondary characters, especially in cozy mystery. People get really involved in the characters, the cast of characters around your main character. And they want to know what's happened with the lady who owns the bookstore. And that person that left on the trip to England, do they come back? Are they still there? They want to know all these things. So I think that can give you things to carry from book to book as well. Yes. And these secondary character types, uh, as you say, they're archetypes. And again, I'm trying not to give any spoilers for my (laughs) books, but in one of my books, one of the significant secondary characters, I just felt the story demanded that he did 
die. And <laughs> it was, but then what's happened is there's a hole in my archetypes. So I am now trying to fill that hole with another <laughs> secondary character who will fill that kind of role. But it's so, in, it, it is really interesting how the secondary characters go. And as you say, you can write um, more about that character of people particularly like them or you can like one of the things because I've got a pair Morgan Mm -hmm. and Jake and it's funny you actually mentioned romance because one of my things is that they're always there's some tension romantic Mm -hmm. tension but they'll never they're never going to get together and I think of Bones did you watch Mm -hmm. you must have watched Bones and uh, Castle as well and yes while those characters never got together those series were really good Mm-hmm. And then as soon as it, anything actually happened, that's when the tension w- went. And right. yeah, so I think having romantic tension between your characters in something that's not a romance where they never get together is <laughs> it's a good way. But I get yes. a lot of reader email that say, when are Morgan and Jake going to get together? And of course, my answer is has to be never. <laughs> <laughs> Do you tell your readers that though? No, I don't. No, I don't. I, of course I don't say that. I say, we'll see in the next book. But the other thing I, I've done is I have had books where Morgan has gone off. So my Day of the Vikings, she get, she goes off on her own and actually mm-hmm. has an adventure with a character from another book, um, from my Desecration series. And <laughs> so I do that. Or Jake went off on his own and had a book on his own with another character. And so sometimes you can do that sort of different things where yes. the plots are still episodic yes and you can like separating them I've done that too where you separate them um, especially if they've gotten a little bit closer they the relationship has inched a little bit closer than oh somebody has to go out of town now (laughs) for at least half the next book (laughs) (laughs) oh no that is good so then I talk about the marketing because I do think speed is one thing I definitely know that I don't have to reinvent my character although I tell you what I do (laughs) to do so I'm not one of those people who has a world bible so what I did find (laughs) after that two-year break was oh my goodness I can't even remember the basics about my character so I actually had to almost skim I've got Mm -hmm. a vellum file that has all the books in and I'll just be doing um, control f and finding Mm -hmm. the different characters and I know I should have a world bible but whenever I start it I just can't get there so what do you do to remember all those things between the books what I've started doing lately with my most recent series is I'm trying to write books at least one and two back to back before I release one and so with the last the historical series I wrote one two and three and that really helped with the continuity and then also I had things that happened in book three that I was like oh let me go back and fix that in book one so it makes more sense so I liked that And that was helpful, but I know not everybody can do that. And I may not be able to do that every time, but I've done the same thing. When I first started out, I didn't have, I still don't have a series Bible where I list everything. Some people have incredibly complicated spreadsheets and there are VAs that will do that for you. They'll go through and they'll create a series Bible for you. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) And it's a great idea. I, so what I actually have now is I have a Trello board that I've, keep with and I put the images of the character I have I find an image of what I think the character would look like and I'll put a description of that from the book in there and I have the characters and then I have the places that they visit the country homes or if they go on a trip what the train looked like so that I can find and I'm very visual so that helps me because I can go and look at the image and read the quick description that helps me but I've also done the just control F and f- go back into the old stories and just refresh my memory like that. I've heard of other authors that have listened to their audiobooks again, which mm. that's a big time commitment. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm on book 12 and it, it, yeah. it's, and I have thought about getting someone to do my story Bible, but then the other thing is what I do find is when I do go back and look at things, I discover uh, threads myself mm-hmm. that spark off ideas or Yeah, it's almost reading your own work that can give you more ideas for new work and someone else would never be able to to give me that right. spark they would just yeah. be able to take what's there whereas we have some I don't know if I have any insight into the brain of the Joanna Penn who wrote Stone of Fire back when it was <laughs> Pentecost back in sort of 2009 
I, I think right. I'm such a different person now. So when I read the words I wrote back then, I actually get new ideas and think, oh, I could do this, that and the other. So it's actually dangerous to reread <laughs> your own work. Are you surprised sometimes? I find I go back and I'm thinking, oh, I'd forgotten I made this character have this little quirk and it makes me want to bring things back or do things, you know, that I'd forgotten. I was like, oh, I could fill in this story plot here. I didn't really describe this whole thing and that could be a whole nother plot line. Mm. Oh, I literally can't remember most of what I've ever written. I mean, <laughs> that's why, that's actually one of the reasons I say to people, and I've said to you, because I'm covering on your podcast as well, it's just, can you let me know what we're talking about? Because even with my <laughs> sure. nonfiction, I'm like, okay, if you want to talk about this book, I need to basically go back and check that I remember what I said. And I wonder if this is part of being a writer. It's like the only way for me to know what I think is by writing. Mm-hmm. And so I need to remind myself what I think by reading what I wrote. <laughs> Yes, me too. And I find that when I'm in the book, I'm all about that book and I'm just totally immersed in it. And then later I'll get an email from somebody and they'll say, I really enjoyed Mona in book seven. And I'm like, who is Mona? I can't remember her. And I have to go, oh yes, she was a very important character. But it's (laughs) like, my mind is always in the story I'm writing. So yes, I do have to go back and refresh my memory. (laughs) Yeah, I hope that encourages people listening. It's once you've written a certain number of books, you do tend to forget about them. And and that's a good thing too, because we always want to be writing the next book and and everything. So that's it. Sorry, circling back to marketing, because I mentioned it and then went off on a tangent. You mentioned that having several books in a series means that you can do marketing on that first book. But what what are some of the things you do to market that first in series? If the book has been, if the series has been out for a while, I have one series I've dropped to free. The book one is free. I have another series that's $2.99. And that one, I'm thinking of making it 99 cents so I can do some of the promotions like David Gogren has talked about with um, BookBub. Mm. And apparently 99 cents is a really good price point for that. I'll either drop that one soon to 99 cents or free. And then my new series, I'm leaving it at full price, but I'll probably do box sets with that. So I usually... Like in my mind, I've got like this, okay, so the the books are new. I'm not going to put them on sale for a while. Or if I do, it will just be a price drop on book one. And then when I have enough books, I can do a box set, drop the price on that and just use different tactics. And as the books kind of age, then when they're a little bit older, that's when I would drop book one to free or start doing discounts. I know authors that do that rotate through their whole series and just drop the price on each book. If they can get a book bub or whatever type of promotion they decide to do, they just drop each book, the price on each book. And I don't usually do that. I usually drop the first book because my readers, especially in mystery to start with book one. So that makes the most sense for me to do sales and focus all my attention on book one. And then hopefully I get people in, I get them to sign up for my newsletter and then I can take them through this series and my others and introduce them to new series that way. And I do also try and keep some like low budget Amazon ads going. I don't do a whole lot of Facebook that takes a lot of time and I'm not, I'd much rather be writing. I think <laughs> you know. <Wouldn't> we all, <laughs> yeah. but it's interesting. And, like you mentioned um, the book bub ads, that's like uh, sort of nine months ago when the pandemic hit. And uh, I was like, do you know what? Life's too short to do anything I don't enjoy. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, how do I make marketing fiction much easier? And I decided, as you mentioned, he says, if you drop book one in the series and just run ads, so mm-hmm. that's just what I do now pretty much with my fiction is that first in series. It's so easy to market. Mm-hmm first in series with a dropped price and I just even like you mentioned people changing prices on different things as a wide author as I am oh. it, you, it's impossible it's a nightmare it really is <laughs> you can't do that so you might like if you drop the first one Stone of Fire has been free for basically a decade <laughs> Mm-hmm. I know. Now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it's a way, it's a funnel in. And if people right. don't like it, there's no issue. And if they do like it, they'll try other books. So I, mm-hmm. I was going to ask you about box sets. Do you do box sets? I do. Yes. Yeah. So I've got, I, I usually do like books one to three and four to six or seven because one of my ser- or two of my series have seven. And on the, like Hobo and Apple, you can do the books one to seven, you can have a big box set and price it a little bit higher. So I do that and um, submit to Probo or Kobo promotions. You can submit to their, through their promotions tab. Mm. And yeah, and that's another kind of, I keep one of, 
if the book is free or if it's 99 cents, then I just can set up a calendar of ads and submit to the smaller newsletter sites all year long. So it's it, it does make it really easy and it's not as much, it doesn't take as much brain power as like Facebook ads. If you have this discount and you can apply to a newsletter deal, then it's done and that's all you have to do. Mm. No, I think that's right. You've got to find what works for you uh, that is sustainable and and easy. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. it's just too complicated. But I was going to ask you as well, because I am uh, i haven't done my, I just can't help myself, but I have an action adventure series, a crime thriller series or psychological thriller, and then I have fantasy. And mm-hmm. whereas you have kept your mysteries, and even though they're slightly different, that they are within mystery. So do you find that your readers cross into your other series? Or like me, I just find that <laughs> they prefer one over the other and won't even try something else? What's funny is like, I have three contemporary series and one historical, and I have certain readers that they're only historical readers. They don't care about the modern cozies. They're not into that. And then I have some people who are like, no, I'm not into historical. So there's, there is some movement back and forth, but there are readers that are like, nope, not going there. But I do have I like my news, my autoresponder. I'm like, Hey, here's for cozy. If you like cozies, you might like this historical. And I do have people who read everything. Not everybody reads everything. So Mm. they each have their own little niches, but I think that there is more movement between like cozy and historical mysteries than there would be like between historical and fantasy maybe. Yeah. And I just find that I can't help myself. And we have to follow the muse, don't we? But I was looking at all your, what you've got, and we should say about book covers, a critical part of marketing, making it very mm-hmm. clear that your these books yes. are in a series. And you're actually, I highly advise people to go look at your book covers because they mm-hmm. are, to me, they do reflect that these books have some similarities, but they're still quite clear on on series, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's all to my cover artist because I have not artistic at all. But I do, and I always say, I want these to be, to show that they're a group, that they're a series. Yeah. Mm. And that's and that is really important. They have to, and and this is what with people who are in traditional publishing who might move between publishers, and their their books look completely different from one mm-hmm. publisher to another, even if they're the same series, which never makes sense to me. But obviously, everyone has their in house cover designers, and they want to come up with something different to last time. But I definitely think indie authors have more of um, ease of use here because we can yes. change things up and ch- even change the whole series. So definitely, yes. cover is an important part of marketing. And I did want to ask you almost out of time. Time, but what's co- cozy is a, a big genre mystery is a big mm-hmm. genre obviously a, a massive genre but I wondered if you'd seen an uplift during the pandemic or off the back of even something like Bridgerton the kind of feel good area because I, I, I definitely feel at the moment that there might be a, a sort of backlash against the darker books yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't write dark, so I can't compare this series did well and this series did not, But because all mine are pretty lighthearted. But I have had so many emails from people saying, thank you for giving us something to escape. And lots of people saying, I just need something that's not stressful to read right now. Mm. (laughs) So I have seen that and the sales have been good all year long. And I know that I think we all felt when everybody went into lockdown that first time, we all thought, oh my goodness, what's happening? You know, what will happen with the market? But yeah, cozies have done well. And I think there's something about that escaping into a world that even though there's a murder and there's a mystery, you still feel safe there. And the if you like those characters, you want to come back to it. And I think that's the appeal of a cozy mystery or a historical you're escaping to another time where they don't have cell phones and 24 hour news cycles and things like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And of course, we're definitely not saying that you should only write what's popular in the moment because no one can really time that. And also things change. But it seems to me that cozies and mis- mystery is a perennial happy seller, right? And people just yes. love mysteries. Yes, I always have. And there's a big kind of controversy about how cozy or mystery readers in general tend to skew a little bit older. And every once in a while, I'll see these articles about, oh, no, what will we do when, all when the they're cozy, all dead, <laughs> when they all die? And I'm like, I don't know. I think we're OK. And I don't know if people turn to mysteries as they get older. They, if it's just something that but I don't think we're going to run out of mystery readers. 
<laughs> no, I think there will always be plenty. Yeah, that sounds crazy to me because if you look at Netflix, obviously we're all spending a lot of time on mm-hmm. on the streaming services at the moment. And there's a lot of, even if you, I don't know if it, uh, can you have a paranormal cozy? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's, that is a huge subgenre. It's, well, there you go. Uh, which, there's a lot cozies. of those. Yes. Witch cozies. There's a ton of witch cozies. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Witch cozies. Witch knitting cozies. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. All kinds of. I saw one the other day. I can't remember the name of it, but it was a blend of witch cozy and something else. And I was like, oh, that's new. So there are wow. all kinds of variations. Okay. That is brilliant. And I, I think that's really important. And mystery can be a, a subplot in something like a romance as well. And, you know, that yes. mystery as a, a genre sort of crosses a lot of things. And my, I call my books thrillers, which they are, and across all of them. But mystery is an important aspect in solving crimes and, and all of that type of thing. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. Where can people find <laughs> you and your books and courses and everything you do online? Okay, well, you can find all my books. They're, on, they're wide. They're on all the retailers. My website is sarahrosette.com, just Sarah without an H. And um, the website or the podcast that I do for authors is called wish I'd known then podcast.com. And that we just talk to authors about what they wish they'd known lessons they've learned, mistakes they've made, we share our own. And uh, I do that with Jamie Albright. And then I have I'm trying the content marketing thing. And I'm doing a podcast for mystery readers. And it's called mystery books podcast. And that's a seasonal podcast, I should have a new season of that coming up soon. And you can find that on your podcast directory. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Sarah. That was great. Thanks for having me. It was fun to talk to you. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Sarah today and series are the not so secret weapon to making decent money with fiction in particular and help with non-fiction too so I hope the interview gave you some ideas. Coming up this week I have an in between episode on writing with GPT-3 and essentially how do you drive these tools with Paul Bellow who writes in the lit RPG genre and I, I actually have access to GPT-3 now and have been playing with it so I'll be giving my thoughts on that. Then next Monday I'm talking to Patrick O'Donnell from Cops and Writers on how to write authentic crime fiction. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>